Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Five Asset Court SOFA series of webinars. Uh, I'm Alex Ustich. Today, I and my colleagues Aaron Moss and John Goss are going to look at six recent updates on data protection and information law, covering a wide spectrum of topics in the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we will be providing links to the documents and cases we're discussing in the chat as we go along. We will also send out some notes by email later this week. Uh, the email will also include answers to the selection of the questions sent in during today's talk. Uh, first, uh, Aaron will explore two topics, the approach of information regulators to coronavirus and the data protection implications of the Supreme Court's decision in Morris U Supermarkets. Uh, next, John will discuss recent European cases concerning international data transfers and the right to be forgotten. Then I will look at two topics. Uh, firstly, direct electronic marketing, focusing on the Leave EU information tribunal decision. And secondly, the upper tribunal's guidance in the case of Launi uh, on national security exemptions to freedom of information requests. Uh, and now uh, over to Aaron. Thank you, Alex. For those of you who tuned into our webinar while it was live, you might notice that this is actually the second time I've gone through this material because the first time we had some connectivity issues and the recording and the, the broadcast didn't quite work in the way we hoped. But such is life working from home, so I'm, I'm doing it one more time for, for this version. The first topic that we're going to look at in this talk is how regulators across Europe are approaching the challenges of COVID-19 and how that affects data processors, data controllers and individuals whose data is being processed. The European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, is an independent European body which works to ensure a consistent application of data protection rules throughout the European Union. The board's members include representatives of the national data protection authorities and the European Commission has the right to participate in the meetings of the board. The chair of the board is the current head of the Austrian data protection authority. It has produced guidelines on the state processing of health data in the context of COVID-19 the guidance focuses on scientific uses of data. The headline statement is that data protection rules, including the GDPR, do not hinder measures taken in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic because the GDPR is a broad piece of legislation and provides for several provisions that allow organisations to handle the processing of personal data for the purpose of scientific research connected to the COVID-19 pandemic in compliance with the fundamental rights to privacy and personal data protection. There have been many articles in the national press in the past weeks about contact tracing apps, those being developed by Apple and Google internationally, and the version being built by NHS X, the organisation charged with delivering the NHS's tech vision. There have understandably been concerns expressed that once patient data has been obtained by an app such as that, for the purposes of fighting the pandemic, it might be used for other purposes. The EDPB, EDPB guidance deals with this point, stating that there should be transparency of the manner in which data is processed, and that if a further processing for a scientific purpose is, pro is proposed, the data subject should be informed of this within a reasonable period of time before that project begins. However, the board does note that there are four exceptions to the obligation to provide information and that one of those is that to do so would require a disproportionate effort. As an example relating to these circumstances, the board says providing information to a large number of data subjects where there is no available contact information could be considered a disproportionate effort. Last Thursday, the 24th of April, NHSX published an updated blog post on the topic it's been publishing its, its blog posts in, with quite a lot of frequency, and it deals with some of these concerns. It stated in the most recent post that the data will only ever be used for NHS care, management, evaluation, and research. However, that's clearly a broad set of categories and the NHS has given itself some flexibility. The board recognizes that these are exceptional circumstances, and it seems to be advising that a relatively generous construction of legislation should be available to public bodies. The ICO has issued guidance which takes a similar tone. Addressing its regulatory approach during the public health emergency, it describes the reasons for its statement, the reasons being 
the Commissioner notes that organisations are facing staff and capacity shortages. There are severe pressures on health, government, charity and law enforcement authorities, and that those include financial pressures. The ICO says it will, and it must, act in a manner which takes into account these circumstances, and that will include the way that it uses its enforcement powers. The ICO recalls that the law gives it flexibility around how it carries out its regulatory role, for example, as to considering whether an organisation has implemented appropriate and proportionate safeguards. The ICO will take into account, when considering enforcement, the impact of potential economic or resource burden which its actions will have on organisations, and focus its efforts on the most serious challenges and the greatest threats to the public. Despite this, the ICO reminds organisations that they should continue to report personal data breaches without undue delay, and it will take a strong regulatory approach against any organisation which is breaching data protection laws in order to take advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic. Having said that, it may be that any strong response of the regulator will not be progressed exceptionally quickly. The General Regulatory Chamber of the First Tier Tribunal, which hears appeals concerning decisions of the ICO, has today ordered a stay of all cases for a period of one month. This is in addition to the stay that was ordered exactly one month ago. Returning to the Information Commissioner's guidance, the effect is that where the COVID-19 pandemic provides a genuine reason for any difficulties with compliance which an organisation experiences, the ICO is likely to be receptive. The ICO states it's ready to provide maximum support for businesses and public authorities as they recover from the public health emergency. However, organisations must, as always, be cautious about ignoring the problem and should intend to work with the regulator to find a solution. The second topic that we're going to look at today is the claim that was brought against Morrison Supermarkets. On the 1st of April, the Supreme Court handed down its judgment in the appeal against the successful claim by 9,263 employees and former employees of Morrison's, who sought to hold the supermarket vicariously liable for the publication of their personal data. The data had been published by a disgruntled employee. His name was Andrew Skelton. He was a member of the Morrison's internal audit team, and after being the subject of misconduct proceedings, he harboured a grudge. He acted on the grudge. He uploaded payroll data of tens of thousands of employees to a file sharing website using a false email address and a false name. In fact, the name he used was the name of a colleague who had been involved in the misconduct process against him. You might think his motive was quite clear. The primary focus of Lord Reed's judgment is the extent of an employer's vicarious liability for the conduct of its employees. I'm only going to touch on that issue today. I'll say more about what Law Reed described as an important question about the Data Protection Act 1998. I should say though that my colleagues Richard Alton and Rob Cohen are hosting a webinar at this time next week speaking about vicarious liability more generally. I'm sure they will be discussing these other aspects of the Morrison decision in some detail. The 9,263 employees issued a claim against Morrison's for breach of the Data Protection Act, misuse of private information and for breach of confidence. They sought to rely on vicarious liability to hold Morrison's responsible for Skelton's intentional acts. The two issues that the Supreme Court considered were one, could vicarious liability arise in these circumstances at all? And two, does the Data Protection Act 1998 exclude the application of vicarious liability to a breach of that act? In answering the first question, the court held that Mr Skelton was pursuing a vendetta and that although he was authorised to disclose data to certain people, that didn't mean that an unauthorised disclosure was something for which the company could be held vicariously liable. As to the second question, there was less good news for employers and data controllers. The Supreme Court stopped short of holding that vicarious liability can never arise in respect of data protection breaches. Morrison's argument turned on the wording of Section 13 
of the Data Protection Act 1998. An individual who suffers damage by reason of any contravention by a data controller of any of the requirements of this Act is entitled to compensation from the data controller for that damage, unless they can rely on the defence that they've taken such care as in all the circumstances was reasonably required. Morrison's also sought to rely on the seventh data protection principle, that the data controller must take reasonable steps to ensure reliability of any employees of his who have access to personal data. Where Mr Skelton was data controller in his own right, and where Morrison's had discharged its obligation on them to take reasonable steps, it followed, in the argument advanced by the supermarket, that they couldn't be under a vicarious liability for Skelton's breach. Damning with faint praise, Lord Reed described this argument as attractive, but not persuasive. The court drew a distinction between Morrison's statutory duties under the Act and the common law imposition of vicarious liability for the acts of its employees. There was nothing inconsistent between the two, the court said. The DPA is silent as to whether an employer is responsible for the acts of its employees who are data controllers. The effect of the judgment from a data protection angle is that although Morrison's was not vicariously liable on these facts, the act being a wrongful act not authorised by the employer, there could well be circumstances where an employer would be liable for an employee's data protection breaches. And now we're going to step out of this recording and step back into the, the webinar itself. I'm going to pass you into the capable hands of John. If anybody can make the potentially very dry topic of international data transfers come to life, then I'm confident it is him. Um, then I'm, I'm confident it's him. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I'm going to talk about two topics. Uh, the first is data transfers outside the European Union, uh, and the second is the latest European case law uh, on the right to be forgotten. So starting with international data transfers, uh, the technical area uh, of these personal data transfers, international transfers, um, is rising up the agenda, um, not least because the end of the transition period for Brexit uh, is going to render the UK a third country for the purposes of EU data protection law. At present, transfers of personal data under GDPR to third countries uh, are generally on the basis either of an adequacy decision under Article 45 uh, or standard contractual clauses, uh, SCCs, uh, approved by the European Commission uh, under Article 46.2. Uh, they're the main example of appropriate safeguards uh, in that article. Uh, now, the restrictions on international transfers can also be derogated from by in individual consent. Uh, as well as in other limited circumstances under Article 49. Uh, now, international data transfers, of course, can arise in all sorts of scenarios, uh, very common uh, whenever dealing with, for example, social media companies uh, or anything involving um, cloud computing uh, for data to be transferred outside the EEA to servers overseas. Now, the compatibility of standard contractual clauses uh, with EU law has been challenged in the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, by privacy activist Max Schrems. Uh, Max Schrems was previously responsible uh, for the termination of the previous safe harbour adequacy decision for EU USA data transfers. Um, in other words, uh, he's got form in this area. Now, the Advocate General issued his opinion in Schrems 2 uh, on the 29th of December. I think there's a link to it in the chat. Uh, the Court of Justice's decision itself is still pending, uh, but it's likely uh, to broadly follow uh, the Advocate General's view. Uh, they do in about 80% of cases. Uh, now, the Advocate General's view was that SCCs do provide an adequate level of protection, but that data controllers ought to be ensuring that they're adhered to by the third country transferee uh, and data protection authorities, so the ICO in the UK, um, ought to suspend transfers if they consider that the data subject's rights are not being adequately protected. Uh, and the Advocate General also queried, uh, after stating that he didn't really need to explore the issue, and then going on to explore it in great detail, uh, the safeguards within Privacy Shield, the successor uh, to Safe Harbour. Now, it might be, as I said, uh, the Advocate General said he didn't really need to consider it. It might be that this is not the case um, where Privacy Shield gets tested, 
but it is likely that that partial adequacy decision um, is going to come under intense scrutiny uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, if not in this case, there's at least one other case on the CJEU's docket uh, which, see, which raises a challenge to it. So we'll have to see what the Court of Justice says about it. Uh, but it does appear as though the Advocate General, at least, is emphasising that the transfer rules are not something to pay lip service to. Uh, both data controllers and data protection authorities uh, are obliged to police them in order to uphold data subjects' rights. Uh, domestically, um, the UK Supreme Court's recent decision in El Ghazuli and the Secretary of State for the Home Department um, makes, in effect, the same point. That was a case um, where the Home Secretary proposed uh, to transfer evidence held by the UK uh, about one of the um, ISIS beetles, uh, the terrorists, um, to the USA uh, for a trial in which the death penalty was a possibility. Uh, and it was held that that was not in accordance with the law enforcement provisions of the DPA 2018. It wasn't based on an adequacy decision or appropriate safeguards, and none of the possible derogations applied. Now, of course, while that was a uh, law enforcement part three of the DPA uh, decision, uh, the controls on international data transfers under the GDPR um, are very similar. The principal reason uh, for saying that the transfer was unlawful, uh, or the decision to transfer was unlawful, was that the Home Secretary had not properly considered the issue uh, in accordance with the relevant procedural requirements. Uh, substantial compliance, said the Supreme Court, um, was not enough. Um, but the Supreme Court did also tentatively implore, uh, explore uh, whether, when you're balancing the rights and freedoms uh, of the data subject with the necessity for a data transfer, uh, the right to life would always outweigh uh, necessity of transfer. But ultimately, it decided it didn't need to decide that issue. So the result was that the decision to transfer the evidence to the USA uh, was quashed on procedural grounds. Now, obviously, this is a, an unusual uh, set of facts. Um, but it is a valuable reminder that questions around data transfers uh, are neither straightforward, uh, nor can lip service simply be paid to them. Uh, and that brings me to the final issue on this topic, uh, what about Brexit? Uh, on 10th of January 2020, the European Commission published a set of slides which set out their approach to negotiating the future relationship in relation to data transfers. That set out the goal of a determination by the European Commission on an adequacy decision for the UK by 31st of December this year, with the UK in the same time frame taking steps to ensure mechanisms are in place for the transfer of personal data to the EU, as well as a compliance system for transfers from the UK outside the EU. Now, by limiting the ability to transfer some kinds of data, at least, to the USA, uh, El Ghazuli uh, might upset the apple cart on that latter angle, because if one of the goals the UK wants to achieve is freer, uh, easier transfers to the USA for personal data, well, that will reduce the scope for a robust adequacy decision uh, with respect uh, to the EU. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is coronavirus. It's debatable how much work is really going to have been carried out uh, on a UK-EU adequacy decision, mutual adequacy decisions, in effect, by December 2020. And without an extension of the transition period, and the government currently says it will not seek and will not accept such an extension, uh, it seems likely that there may be a serious bump in the road come 2021. And the UK could be left with a domestic system that prevents free transfer of personal data to the USA uh, and to other third countries because it's so closely based on the EU system with all of the controls that that imposes but no recognition by that EU system in return. Uh, in effect, the worst of both worlds. And there's ample scope for both economic disruption and inadvertent unlawful transfers as a result, uh, obviously creating um, scope both for uh, actions by individuals, um, but also for disrupting um, contracts between uh, organizations as well. And then we had a come back, coming back to the question of SHREMS 2. Uh, if Privacy Shield is struck down by the CJEU at around the same time, limiting transfers um, to the USA from the EU, um, then we're left towards the end of this year or the start of next with potentially something of a perfect storm 
uh, for international data transfers. The next topic I'm going to deal with um, is the right to be forgotten. Uh, so the lead UK case uh, remains NT1 uh, and NT2 and GU uh, from April 2018. Um, by way of a reminder, Mr Justice Warby held that when a request for delisting of information about previous criminal convictions is made to a search engine, there is a balancing exercise to conduct between the right to rehabilitation and to a private life under Article 8 uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, and the general right to freedom to access information and freedom of expression uh, under Article 10, all obviously within the framework um, of the GDPR. Importantly, um, Warby J also held um, two other points. First, um, as a general rule, uh, it's when a conviction becomes spent under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, that Article 8 will become engaged by processing uh, of information about it, since criminal justice takes place in public and there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, at least to begin with. Uh, and secondly, he held uh, that Google weren't, as a search engine, um, weren't entitled to rely uh, on the journalistic exemptions uh, for processing. Um, but there have been some interesting refinements at the European level uh, since that decision. First, in the Canel case from France, the Canel is the French equivalent of the ICO, uh, the CJEU ruled in September that there's no basis in EU law uh, for requiring global delisting by a search engine, only within the EU. Now, there, there is scope for there to be space for global delisting uh, and national law. Uh, Article 17.1e of the GDPR uh, creates the possibility of that. But the French uh, Conseil d'État has ruled that there's no such basis in French law, uh, and there doesn't appear to be a basis in UK law either. So the right to be forgotten uh, applies only to information published within the EU. But of course, once Brexit takes effect, uh, that's likely only to, uh, to be, uh, it's likely to be applicable only to information published uh, within the UK. Um, secondly, uh, in Germany, uh, in the snappily titled decision, uh, Right to be Forgotten 2, that's the Recht auf Vergessen 2, uh, for those who prefer the original, uh, the German Constitutional Court uh, has somewhat thrown down the gauntlet to the CJEU's position in Google Spain. Google Spain, of course, the decision that really created the Right to be Forgotten back in 2012. Uh, that search engine operators do not get to rely on freedom of expression, freedom of information rights, uh, as they apply to journalistic processing, in contrast to the position of original content providers. And uh, you'll recall uh, that Warby J uh, effectively followed that uh, in NT1 and NT2. Uh, and in, then in a second right to be forgotten decision, uh, right to be forgotten one, Recht auf Vergessen eins, uh, the GCC has suggested that the right um, is not a primarily individual right uh, about control of data, which can only be defeated by a heightened public interest in continuing to make that personal information available, but rather that it's a heavily qualified right where the wider public interests should be given essentially equal weight to that of the individual. The individual right is more akin to the right not to be defamed or harassed, uh, as opposed to a manifestation uh, of individual control over their personal information, personal data. Now, of course, you might recognize uh, in that blended test from RTBF1 uh, what is all, already in effect the position in English law uh, per NT1 and 2. It's a balancing exercise with no one right having automatic priority. It's, uh, thank you, Victoria, I'm, I'm, from the uh, commentary on my German pronunciation, I apologize for it. Um, it's a balancing exercise with no one right having automatic priority. Um, and it's likely that uh, in due course, uh, the Court of Justice is going to be asked to rule on these German developments. Now, it's probably likely to uphold its earlier position. Um, that increases the scope, potentially, to challenge the blended balancing exercise that currently exists uh, in English law, um, with an effort to weigh it more heavily towards uh, individual rights. Um, on the other hand, uh, the suggestion that search engines as well as content providers might be able to rely on, for, for example, freedom of information type rights, uh, Article 10 type rights, uh, is something that weights it back the other way. But so it seems likely um, that despite the relatively settled position uh, in English law following NT1 and 2, 
um, that there's likely to be further um, debate and further development um, of how the RTBF should be applied in practice. Um, I'm going to pass over to Alex now um, to take you through uh, our last two topics and, uh, and hopefully I can get, at least get this one right. Um, Auf Wiedersehen. Dankeschön, John. Uh, it's delightful to be able to travel around Europe by your information law presentation while we can't in person, and notwithstanding what Victoria said about your pronunciation. Um, on to information law uh, closer at home. Uh, I will talk about a recent information tribunal decision about electronic direct marketing communications. Uh, although at first glance, this might appear a dry subject, the involvement of one Aaron Banks and a kangaroo called Skippy uh, makes it far less so. Uh, the appeal in question is that Levy U and Elden Insurance Services and Information Commissioner, a link should be popping up in your chat box now, it was heard before a panel chaired by the president of the information tribunal, Judge McKenna. Uh, Levy U is a company created to campaign in support of Brexit, uh, while Eldon provides insurance services under the brand name uh, of Go Skippy with a kangaroo mascot. Uh, Aaron Banks is the majority shareholder of the parent company that owns both Levy U and Eldon. The information commissioner and Mr. Banks uh, previously had a tense relationship uh, in response to the commissioner's earlier uh, monetary penalty notice, Mr. Banks released a press release titled A Heartfelt Apology, which in respect to the information commissioner included the single word, whatever. Uh, the appeal we're discussing today concerned the general prohibition on non-consensual electronic direct marketing communications in Regulation 22 of the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulation 2003. The commi commissioner concluded that Eldon instigated the transmission of over a million unsolicited direct marketing communications found inside 21 Levy U political newsletter, which were sent out to its subscribers. The marketing was in the form of a Go Skippy banner with a kangaroo, uh, offering a discount for insurance services, uh, which was called the Brexit Independence Policy and offered you a unique 10% discount. And this is found uh, within an otherwise political newsletter. The commissioner concluded that Leave EU newsletter subscribers uh, did not provide valid consent for being sent insurance kangaroos. The penalties imposed, uh, which were being ch challenged on appeal, were £60,000 for Eldon and £45,000 for Leave EU, uh, reflecting their different financial situations. Uh, Leave EU and Eldon appealed uh, pro broadly on two grounds. Firstly, that the commissioner has not followed a fair procedure and was apparently biased. And secondly, that the Levy U newsletters did not include direct marketing material on behalf of Eldon, and so there was no breach of the regulations at all. Uh, the tribunal gave short shrift to the appellant's procedural attack. Uh, it is not enough for an appellant to critique the twists and turns of the commissioner's investigation to demonstrate unlawfulness. The most serious of allegations about the investigation would need to be made out. Here, although the investigation the commissioners undertaken was not perfect, there was insufficient evidence to back up any serious allegation of apparent bias or procedural fault. Uh, this case shows that an attack on the commissioner's investigation or, or notices on procedural grounds is only going to succeed in exceptional cases and procedural nitpicking is unlikely to get an apparent far in the information tribunal. Uh, in large part, this is because the tribunal undertakes a full merits review of the commissioner's decision based on evidence presented to it effectively a trial, and so can cure earlier procedural deficiencies. The second substantive challenge in the appeal was whether including the banner amounted to a direct marketing communication at all. And if it did, whether the subscriber's consent to receive the newsletter extended to the insurance ads in light of um, Leave EU's privacy policy online. The tribunal had no hesitation in finding the banner amounted to direct marketing material, as did associating Skippy the kangaroo with Mr. Banks's uh, business interests in Go Skippy Insurance and his political views. The tribunal noted that there would be no other reason to include a kangaroo in the political newsletter other than to reinforce the association with Eldon's product. Uh, that's probably a line you're not going to see uh, in many other case reports. Uh, the tribunal went on to find that being sent insurance product marketing from another company was outside the contemplation of the subscribers when they signed up for the newsletter. Uh, 
This was reflected in some complaints having been received from no subscribers. Specifically, the tribunal rejected the appellant's argument that it should look at the primary purpose of the newsletter, in this case, political or marketing, when considering whether the regulations were engaged or breached. If members of the public who signed up to receive one type of mail could be sent any other material at will, this would obviously water down the protection offered by the regulations. Or as was more pithily put by the commissioner's counsel in argument, a spam sandwich nonetheless contains spam. The tribunal did also consider Levy used privacy policy to see if it uh, offered the consent necessary. Uh, the policy referenced sending to subscribers what we feel may interest you and found uh, the tribunal found that this didn't amount to a valid consent for marketing communications from third parties. And this was because that provision or that line was so all encompassing that it didn't meet the legal requirements for freely given specific and informed consent, which of course, recent GDPR and Data Protection Act 2018 legislation has further reinforced. Uh, lastly, the tribunal applied the test in the, uh, Microsoft and McDonald to determine if Eldon could be penalized for instigating the marketing communications. Now this is relevant because Regulation 22 applies not just to those who actually transmit the marketing material, so here that was leave EU, but also those who instigate the transmission. The test from Microsoft and McDonald is whether the actions amounted to a positive encouragement as opposed to mere facilitation. The tribunal found the test to be made up as Eldon via Mr. Banks controlled the timing and content of that kangaroo message. The penalties were upheld at the level set by the commissioner with the tribunal agreeing that the breach was serious, especially having regard to the million or so recipients to those newsletters. Moving on uh, to my uh, next topic. Uh, so uh, moving swiftly from Skippy the Kangaroo to James Bond, uh, we will wrap up our talk today with a foray into FOIA and yes, I did write that to Ryan, uh, namely section 23 of the Freedom of Information Act 2000 concerning security bodies. Uh, we will look at the recent upper tribunal decision in Laumi and Information Commissioner, which introduces much needed clarity in the previously confused and confusing area. Uh, and that's appearing in your chat boxes now. Uh, Mr. Laumi made a request to the National Archives for a closed Foreign and Commonwealth Office file concerning Donald McLean and Guy Burgess. Uh, those are, of course, two of the Cambridge Five uh, spy ring. Part of the request concerned an individual's vetting. Section 23 uh, of the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, uh, which is ordinarily an absolute exemption, prevents disclosure of information which relates to specified bodies, which includes the security services, MI5, MI6. Uh, absolute exemptions uh, within FOIA, of course, those which do not require a public interest balancing exercise to be undertaken. If the exemption is engaged, um, given the statutory wording, that is the end of the matter. But unusually, the twist in this case uh, is these files have been transferred because of the passage of time to the National Archives. Uh, Section 64.2 of FOIA means that in no circumstances, Section 23 is no longer an absolute exemption, becomes a qualified one. And what, what does that mean? It means that uh, the public interest in keeping back the information from being disclosed has to be weighed up uh, against the public interest in disclosure. Uh, and even if Section 23 was engaged, it can be outweighed by the public interest. Uh, given the impact of Section 23 as an exemption of it being engaged, uh, the issue of what it actually takes for it to be engaged uh, is a really hard fought one in national security cases. And that's because uh, often, if it's an absolute exemption on the facts, uh, once it's made out, that's the end of the case or, or the appeal. So the key words are relate to a security body. And uh, there's been a number of decisions on this. And as, as I mentioned, a very confusing, confusing uh, approach to uh, that wording. But the general thrust of cases, as exemplified in the upper tribunal case of APGA in 2016, was that relate to should not be construed narrowly and should not be embellished to include a requirement for information to directly relate to security bodies. Uh, the reason for this broad application uh, is the backdoor argument, uh, and this is that uh, what appears to an outsider, uh, including the tribunal, anodyne, uninformative, and lacking in interest, may in fact, to those in the know, provide information about matters relating to a security body. 
Uh, this is a concern uh, that uh, does not appear to be fanciful given Lowney's context of Soviet spies in the British security services. Uh, however, these um, waters were much muddied by a 2017 upper tribunal decision in uh, Corduroy, which suggested that where the information which may be covered by Section 23 uh, as an absolute exemption also comes within the scope of another qualified exemption, uh, for example, legal advice or formulation of government policy, uh, Section 23 might not then be applied. Uh, the rationale in the upper tribunal appears to be, well, Parliament would have meant for uh, a public interest test exemption to be applied there instead to weigh up the factors. Uh, reading between the lines of the upper tribunal decision in this case, Lowney, uh, Judge Marcus QC did not agree uh, with the corduroy approach and very diplomatically confined it uh, to its own facts in this respect. The fact is that the conflict between Corduroy and APCA has been resolved, much to the relief of anyone who practices in this area, because these are very low judgments. Uh, the words relates to should not be construed narrowly. Uh, the possible application of other exemptions is not relevant to whether Section 23 itself applies, and there should be no judicial gloss on the Section 23 test. Uh, on the facts of a particular case, it's possible that information will be too remote to relate to security bodies. But this is a value judgment to be made in each case, having regard to the very compelling Section 23 public policy objective. With these principles in mind, the upper tribunal readily found that Section 23 was engaged by the information sought here. The vetting file of a civil servant plainly had a connection to a security body. Uh, when it came to balancing the public interest, uh, as I mentioned, this was unusual and that Section 23 required that exercise to be undertaken. Uh, the scales do not start off being empty because on the one hand, you have public interest behind Section 23, uh, and the reason why it was made absolute is because it protects some really vital national security considerations versus the public interest in disclosure. Uh, the tribunal had no real hesitation in finding that um, it was the public interest in holding back the information which prevailed here. Uh, Lamy is now the go-to authority when dealing with Section 23 national security cases, because it clearly sets out the key principle and crucially for any lawyer, is much easier to understand than previous cases uh, on this subject. Um, so you will find more information on this uh, and other developments we discussed today in the follow-up email uh, later this week. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We hope that you do now feel better equipped to deal with um, information law matters, even in these difficult times. Uh, as Aaron mentioned earlier, please tune in at the same time next week for another SOFA series webinar, uh, Vicarious Liability, Where Are We Now?, with Robert Cohen and Richard Olson. Uh, until then, uh, have a good week and stay safe.